Before we begin with today's scary stories, I just wanted to say thank you to every one of you that has been subscribing to the channel as well as watching the videos. As most of you have probably already noticed, I've really been doing my best to get you all these video uploads and it's great to see the appreciation being shown. By the way, we're very close to 100,000 subscribers. As of the time of recording this video, we're only less than 800 subscribers away. That's where I want to ask all of you a huge favor. Please make sure to share the creepy fox with at least one family member or even a friend and tell them about all the great scary stories content that they can look forward to. Or you can also share the channel on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, or wherever. The beauty is that it's free and easy and it doesn't cost you a single dime. So yeah, let's all work together to spread the message of the creepy fox and let's reach that big 100,000 subscribers. Anyway, with that said, let's get started with the scary stories. Over four years ago, I went to work at a warehouse in the small town that I'm from. I decided to leave after my health started to get worse physically and I was diagnosed with panic disorder and severe anxiety after the situation that I'm about to tell you of. This changed the way that I developed friendships after that job, that's for certain. So I started this job on April Fool's Day of 2018, which was odd to me, and I had no kind of high expectation of the job itself. All I wanted was to do my job, get paid, and go home, as I had two children at home and many things that I could work on there. The job wasn't hard, and it made pretty good money for all the duties considered, so I really couldn't complain. I worked second shift for about five months, and I went to day shift. Anyway, while working on second shift, I mostly kept to myself. That is, until one day, I met someone from one of the lines after we struck up a conversation about gaming. For the sake of anonymity, we'll call him JF. Well, JF was a pretty good guy and we had a lot of things in common. I went home that night, and he popped up as a suggested friend on Facebook. Again, another strange oddity. So I decided to just add him. When I did, we started talking more at work, until he suggested that we should just hang out. So we did hang out, pretty frequently. We were friends for a month at this point, and one day, he decided that he was going to introduce me to his partner. She seemed decent at first, super nice, didn't seem to be a judgmental type, so I was cool with her. From then on, I would hang out with him when my kids were spending time with my mother. One time, we were talking at a restaurant, and he started to vent to me, saying things like, Dude, she's such a bitch sometimes. The other day I forgot to take the trash out and she threatened to stab me if I didn't. I've never been in a relationship where someone's threatened me, but she's got good intentions, dude. When he said that to me, I was concerned, but of course, we had only been friends for a month or so. So I thought that maybe, maybe he was being morbid and joking too. So I chuckled at him. He gave me a pretty serious look and said, I'm not joking, she really did. That concerned me. So anyway, fast forward about 8 months, they're still together and we all hang out pretty frequently, forgetting the things that he told me then. One day, we were all talking and he seemed a little bit off that day. So I asked him what was going on and what was wrong with him right in front of her. He flashed a smirk and said, Nothing dude, I'm just a little bit tired. He didn't have his eyes on me though. He had them on her when I asked that. When we went to work the next day, I asked him again, Do you promise to keep this between us? Of course, I agreed. 
He said that he was breaking up with her, and she went a little bit crazy. He said that she grabbed her gun and pointed it at him, and said, If I can't have you then, no one will. He said that he diffused the situation, and he is trying to look for a way out. Not really knowing what to say, I just said, You're going to figure it out, man. If you need somewhere to go then, you can come stay with me until you get her out of the house. Fast forward to another year, he finally decided to leave her. When he did, she flipped out again. This time, he had told her over text message. She said that she was going to find him and kill him and he was actually out of work that day with a vacation day. He sent me a text message that said, Hey, let me know if she comes over to work looking for me. That struck me as odd because I had no idea of the situation that was unfolding. She actually did come over to our job and she asked me where he was and I said, I have no idea. I thought he was with you and you guys went out of town or something. All she did was roll up her windows and drive off. I called him and told him that she came by and he had called the police about it. They had found her up the road with a loaded gun in her vehicle. Two months later, he decided to talk to her again, and when he did, he had something to tell me. When he called me, he asked if I had seen her around, and I hadn't. He said, I would take some vacation days if I were you. Dumbfounded, I asked him why. He said to me, Because she is out of jail, and her cousins are in town trying to find the people that she has personal vendettas with. You're one of them. At that point, I was terrified. I grabbed my kids and went out of town. I took two weeks off of work. I then come to find out that the following day, her and her cousins went to the next town over, and they shot three people in an apartment and killed them. I got the news about it the day after it happened. The reason why he knew that they were coming after me is because they made a Facebook messenger group that he was included in and he was sent a list of names. Everyone regarded it as spam and decided to disregard the message, but he knew what it was. Three of the names on that list were the people that they shot. The fourth name on that list was mine. After they found the evidence, and he decided to go public about the group, as well as screenshots that he had, they were all charged with first degree murder. From that moment on, I was very careful about who I would stick my neck out for, because even though he knew the context of that list, as well as her intentions, he decided to not inform anyone else on it. Needless to say, we aren't friends anymore. And I dodged a bullet, literally. Anyway, sorry for the long post. I felt like it needed some context. So with that said, stay safe, everyone. So to start off the story with some context, I was about 15 to 16 years old at the time. It was my best friend's birthday and she had invited about six of us over to her place so we could play some games, such as Mario Party, Mario Kart, Guitar Hero, and such. We would stay the night in celebration of our big 16. So at this get-together, there were five girls, including myself, and one boy. After a while, my best friend asked if we would like to go to the playground which was about a 10 minute walk away from her house. Of course, being the stupid teenagers we were, we agreed. We weren't thinking of how it might be dangerous, since the majority of us were young girls, and it was currently 10 p.m. Anyway, we walked down to this park, and we continued playing grounders when we arrived, which, if you don't know, it's a game commonly played in elementary schools. The rules are simple. One person is it, but the person who is it must then close their eyes and try to seek the other players as they hide on playground equipment in order to tag them. However, there is a catch. If someone gets off the equipment 
and the person who is it calls grounders while they're on the ground, then they are tagged. Yeah, I know it sounds like a pretty childish game, but it is fun. Anyway, after a few rounds, we got bored and decided to huddle around in a circle in the center of the playground equipment. We were just talking, joking around, when suddenly, I heard what I thought to be something like rocks. It hit the chain link fence that resided on the back of the playground. I hushed the group. I then looked over at my best friend, asking if she heard that, as everyone looked at me like I had ten heads. She asked what I meant, and when I told her it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at the fence behind us, she responded with the classical, Oh, it's a murder coming to get us. Naturally, I glared at her, flipping her off. She knows I get paranoid sometimes, but I have very good intuition, and something just felt off. A few minutes later, after some rocks were thrown at the fence, I obsessively stared down the area behind the fence, which was all woods beside the houses on the left and right to the playground, in paranoia. I noticed a light weaving its way through the branches of the trees. At first, I thought maybe it was just a headlight of a car that was coming down the street, which connected to the street to the park, since you can vaguely see the headlights of oncoming traffic through them. But I soon realized there was only one light, and it was bouncing up and down like it was being held by someone who was walking. I quickly pointed it out to the group around me, as we all snapped our heads over in that direction. Coming up along the side of the nearby house, on the left side of the park, was a man who wore a hat, some white, baggy, and dirty sweatpants, and a black coat. He was holding a flashlight, not the one on your phone, but an actual flashlight. He was too far away to guess his age, even when he sat on the swings closer to the playground equipment that we were on but we all collectively agreed it was strange, since he seemed, I guess from his clothing, to be at least mid-twenties and just came out of the woods by himself so he could sit and stare at a load of kids. After a brief discussion, we agreed that maybe he was waiting for a ride or was just resting for a moment, so we tried to brush the fact off that he was sitting and so intensely staring at us. However, we started to take note that after a few minutes of us resuming our very competitive game of grounders, the stranger was slowly inching his way closer to our group. He went from sitting on the one swing furthest away, to the next swing a bit closer to the equipment we were on, to the next, until he was just about 10 feet away from our game. Mind you, the whole time he just sat there watching us. At this point, all of us have noticed the strange man attempting to get closer to us, and in an attempt to remove ourselves from a potentially dangerous situation, we made a group decision to leave. Getting up, we all piled off of the playground equipment, and in pairs of two, we walked down the stairs on the side furthest away from the creepy man. As we attempted to casually walk away, I kept my eyes glued to his figure, and as we neared the end of the street, he suddenly got up, slowly at first. The man then started to trail behind us, keeping his distance. I decided to keep my mouth shut at the time, because we were about to make a turn. I thought that if he continues to follow us instead of going the other way, then I'd bring it up to the others. And, well, wouldn't you know it, but the creep stays hot on our heels, not only following which turn we took, but he also started sprinting toward us and screaming, You asshole, I'll kill you. At this point, the whole group burst out into a sprint. The adrenaline I felt made me run so fast I was ahead of everybody else. Everyone was ushering each other to run. I didn't even take a second to see if the others were behind me. That was until I heard my best friend struggling to run. She has pretty bad asthma. I instantly felt horrible for running off on her. So, I ran back by her side, grabbing her hand, and quite literally dragging her along, repeating things like, Deep breaths. You got this. Come on, we gotta go now. 
This whole time, the man was still running and screaming behind us and was catching up quickly. At this point, both me and another girl in the group took it upon ourselves to get my best friend moving as fast as possible, both taking a hand and running at a pace that she could keep up with. Luckily, this park was only about a 10 minute walk from my friend's house, if even that much, and as we all piled in through her garage door, I turned to see this delusional man start running up her driveway. He got about halfway, until our big fluffy savior ran to the open door. My friend's 100 pound, fully grown German shepherd, she lunged at the man barking as we gripped her collar in an attempt to keep her from running completely after the man. Luckily, her sudden and loud appearance caused the man to freeze in fear before then running away down the dark, lamp-lit street. We were terrified for the rest of the night and only managed to sleep after putting random items next to us. We even had a rake as well. But most comforting, our big fluffy hero, just in case the creep decided to come back. So to the crazy creep who enjoys watching kids at the park and then chasing them home, let's not meet again. As a vacation, two of my friends and I decided to take a road trip from New York to New Orleans. However, as we wanted to save money, we decided to use the Greyhound and then make a few stops with a couple of days in each before then reaching New Orleans. However, at the Atlanta Greyhound station, that was the most afraid for my life that I've ever been. In full disclosure, I must say this was due to a stupid decision once reaching the station. We arrived at night to Atlanta. I cannot remember the exact time, seeing as this happened about 8 to 9 years ago, but I believe it was past 11 p.m., closer to midnight. The hotel was not far at all from the bus station. After using our maps, we make the decision that we're going to walk as it's not that far. Having lived in a big city in the States, I should have actually known better. We were approached by a man with an available cab, but we said, no thank you, and continued walking as the cab driver seemed to have a certain vibe about him. Now, imagine the scene. Three well-to-do young men dragging large suitcases down a very bad part of the city. From the station, we started walking, and in less than a minute, we were approached by this lady, who I'm pretty sure was on crack, and she seemed to have the features too. She kept on saying that she needs some money, and that if we go with her, she's going to show us a good time. We repeatedly said no and pick up the speed. The crackhead lady dropped back, but we frequently checked behind us, as we were still feeling pretty unsafe. And that is when we noticed three guys in bandanas, walking 10 to 20 feet behind us. When we stopped to adjust our suitcase, they stopped, and that is when panic really started to set in. All this, and we were barely out of the station. Just then, the crackhead lady comes back, and more aggressively tells us that she needs some money. She's still promising that she's going to make it worth it. All this commotion seemed to get the attention of one of the local bouncers at a strip club, which is near to the station. This guy was massive and immediately started yelling at the crackhead lady to get away from us. After some back and forth, another man who seemed to be friends with the crackhead lady walks over and starts loudly arguing with the bouncer. A local security officer from the station saw all of this chaos that happened with a large man and two shifty characters arguing and with three guys in the middle holding suitcases. Again, as a reminder, we're still barely away from the station. The security officer lectured us about walking away from the station at night and then strongly recommended we get a cab to where we were going. By this time, the three bandana guys were nowhere to be seen, but even so, the officer luckily walked us back to the station. At the taxi area, the man who we originally said no to 
was still there, and the officer told them to drive us. We should have felt better now that we were in the cab, but we soon felt justified as to why we didn't feel right about the cab driver. Once he exited the station and did a few turns, he punched the accelerator and immediately started mumbling to himself. What should have been a very short cab ride took at least a few extra minutes. Only after we said for the third time that we were heading away from where we needed to go, did he turn around and stop outside the hotel. Granted, he was pissed and that is why he decided to take the long way to the hotel, but we thought it was because it was so close to the station. In the cab, he has controls for self-locking the doors and we could see that he locked all the doors. After mumbling to himself for about half a minute, he then started hitting the steering wheel. We were already on edge, but we went back to sheer panic mode. He then said in a loud, but not shouting kind of way, Before, when I offered to take you, you said no. Why was that? Is there something wrong with the way I look? Why the hell did you not just get in the cab, but instead decided to take off? We explained to him that we thought that the hotel could be easily reached on foot, and that we were not familiar with Atlanta. After paying him with a reasonable tip, as not to piss him off further, we got out and fast walked it to the hotel up the entrance path. As we exited the car, I looked to the side of us at the road, and there he was. He was just outside the cab, leaning against the passenger side of the vehicle, and just staring at us with a mean look in his eyes. Not only after checking in did we find the hotel a bit sketchy, but we were petrified that the cab driver was still outside. Despite barricading the door out of fear, none of us slept a peaceful night that night. We switched hotels to a nicer one in the city the next day, and if I ever go to Atlanta again, then I'm never going to take the bus. TLDR arrived to the Atlanta Greyhound station at night and decided to walk rather than take the taxi was then followed by some very unsavory people before going back and getting in the cab that we turned down the first time. He turned out to be a very angry man that refused to let us out of the car after yelling and acting very creepy. About four years ago, I was a junior at a small college in LA County, bordering my town was a large cavernous region known as Turnbull Canyon. It's the kind of place that has a healthy amount of creepy folklore surrounding it, with an area known as Hell's Gates. There's stories of cult activity, gang killings, abandoned mental institutions, and the like. It's basically the kind of stuff you hear about where old places have reputations. In reality, most of the stories came from a tragedy that occurred years prior. A woman's body was found at the base of the canyon, and from then on, the rest is history. Nevertheless, when a photographer friend asked me and another buddy to go out to the canyon in order to take some photos of the LA skyline, I had to oblige. The canyon was about a 30 minute drive from our campus and we had been listening to the King of Limbs the entire drive, which proved to be the perfect ambience to get me feeling pretty anxious about our little excursion. I should also note that I'm a pretty anxious guy in general, so traveling out to a remote area, preceded by its reputation for scary occurrences, admittedly had me thinking twice about the decision. At the top of the canyon, there is a small residential area, a few ritzy houses, surrounded by trees and woods. In order to venture into the canyon itself, you have to follow a main trail with several smaller arteries that split off into other directions, but ultimately, they culminate, after a couple of miles or so, at the base of a steep hill, adorned with an old water tower overlooking the city. Anyway. We parked our car at the top of the canyon road 
divided up the camera gear and made her way out to the trailhead around 1 a.m. by this point. After walking the trail for about five minutes, Dave, the photographer, decided it was time to set up his first shot, while Jeff, our other friend, and myself kept watch. Eventually, he got the shot that he needed, and we continued walking for another five or so minutes before Dave decided to set up his next shot. At this point, the trailhead had disappeared behind us completely, and we were a little less than a quarter of the way to the water tower. While setting up the tripod, we noticed the faint glow of headlights off in the distance, which was strange because the trail isn't meant for vehicles, nor is it big enough for them to pass through. If I recall, it's only about five feet wide, with shrubbery on both sides. This was clearly a bit of a red flag for us, as we were the only people out there, so we immediately packed up our things and ducked off into the brush, waiting for the car to pass on. Eventually, an old pickup truck idled to a stop about 50 yards from where we were hiding. The truck itself was old and rickety, sitting on a lifted chassis, the bed of which was missing entirely. Growing up in the country, I knew it as the type of truck typically owned by backwoods folk who lived in the boonies and preferred to be left to their own devices. We watched in agonizing anticipation as the truck just idled in place for several minutes before then flooring it down one of the other trails, the roar of the engine echoing throughout the canyon. Clearly we were spooked at this point, the three of us speculating as to our next step. Jeff and I were reluctant to continue, while Dave assured to us that it was probably nothing, perhaps just a guy off-roading, as he put it. So, with great reluctance, Jeff and I trudged on behind a Dave toward the water tower to get his final shots. Nevertheless, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the truck. I mean, I knew plenty of people in high school who would go off-roading for fun in the woods, but never on finicky canyon trails barely wide enough to hike on, let alone drive. It just didn't sit right with me. After walking without interference for about an hour, we finally made it out to the water tower. We climbed the hill to the top and took in the view of the city. Dave, once again, started setting up his equipment while Jeff and I stood on both sides of the water tower, keeping watch just in case the truck came back. Nothing. At this point, it's around 3 a.m., Dave decides that he's got all the shots that he needs, so we pack up our equipment and commit to heading back before it gets too late, seeing as how all of us have classes in just a few hours. Just as we're preparing to descend the hill, the truck comes roaring out of the canyon below us, back onto the trail, at which point the driver attempts to climb the hill, revving up the engine loudly. Scared and shitless, the three of us slid off the side of the hill into the brush, clinging to the plants and rocks. As the truck finally made it to the top of the hill, slowly driving around the tower, we could see the glow of the headlights each time it circled above us. After waiting for nearly 10 minutes, while also trying not to make any noise, the truck eventually descended the hill, stopping in the middle of the trail, no more than 100 yards away. We watched as a scruffy man, mid-50s, stepped out of the idling truck and into the glow of its headlights, moseying around while looking at the ground. He then knelt down, looking at something in the dirt, surveying the area intently. As he did so, it became increasingly apparent that he was tracking something. Our footprints. This next part still chills me to the bone. As my friends and I huddled together, 
watching in complete horror, another man wearing a long, dark parka emerged from the brush right where we had been hiking, joining the other man at his side. Apparently, he had been out there the entire time that we were walking the trail, just watching us, following behind at a safe distance. The two of them then talked for a long while, but we couldn't hear a single word. They continued scanning the area, looking at our footprints, but eventually got in the truck and drove off down one of the forks in the trail. We sat in silence for a long time, waiting nearly two hours just to ensure the coast was clear, at which point we made like hell back to our car, down the canyon, and back to our campus, just in time for class. This takes place when I was studying abroad in Milan. I'm from Chicago, currently living in Milwaukee around this time last year. I was 21 years old at the time, and I'm female. I was at the Pam Supermercato supermarket buying my groceries for the week. I'm on the far right of a food aisle, and I see a guy do a double take to look at me from the other end of the aisle. He mutters something and another guy walks beside him and starts staring at me as well. I had grown used to men staring at me, so I thought little of this. I just kept walking to the next aisle. I started inspecting some canned tuna, but could feel them watching me again. I acted like I was turning around to inspect cans of tomatoes behind me, but I checked to see if they were there. Not only were the two guys watching me, but now two more men had joined them. I walked away, again, this time shooting them a pissed off look. I then heard them talking again, but it was too quiet to understand, even if it was louder. My Italian is not the best, and I probably wouldn't have understood them anyway. The four guys walked out of the store, each taking a moment to find me and a look at me before they did. Then they're gone. I'm relieved. About two minutes later, however, I'm going to check out, and a man walks up to me and asks, Do you speak English? I said yes, and asked if he needed any help. He said no, and tells me he's the store manager. His English is not perfect, but he says, I wish to warn you that outside the store are, uh, six, no, seven men. Ah, yes, there are seven men outside waiting for you. You should not go out there for some time. Waiting for me? How do you know they're waiting for me? He laughs nervously, embarrassed. Well, they are saying things about you. They, uh, they're saying things they're going to do to you. And it, yes, the, the things they said, they talked of you. They described you. It is you. They're waiting for you. Do not go out. What things did they say? I asked him. No, 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 you, you don't want to know. No, but do not go outside. They say they wait for you. I look out the front entrance, and I can see them across the street, looking at the front entrance, waiting. There are seven of them, as the man said. Some are pacing. I feel like I'm being hunted. I am freaked out so I start looking through my phone contacts to see who could possibly help me. Before I figure that out, however, the man comes back a minute or two later and says that he found some police officers and told them of the situation. When they started walking towards the seven men, they ended up running away. I am so lucky this man warned me and helped me. I have no idea what would have happened otherwise. It's... One of those things I think about less and less often, but when I do remember it, it scares me. Edit. For those of you that are interested, it was the Pam at Via Olona, 1 3rd, Milano, Italia. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I loved exploring creepy places. A few of us 
had our driver's license, so on weekend nights, we would gather a group of 6 to 10 people and we would go on an adventure. One summer, our favorite place to go to was this abandoned movie theater on the west end of town. This place had closed down probably about three years before we started visiting it, and in that time, it had become a run-down building. There were no trespassing signs on the front entrance, and each of the fire exits around the building, coming from the theater rooms as well, the glass at the main entrance was all broken and had been boarded up. The front door was busted and didn't even latch or lock, so that meant that people were able to get inside. We knew there had to have been homeless people crashing in there, but we were young and dumb and felt invincible in a group. It was part of what made it scary. We would always wait until between 11pm to 2am to go into places like this because we didn't want anyone to see or hear us and report us to the police. We all explored it together the first two times that we went in. The screens and seats were all torn up inside each of the maybe eight rooms. The bathroom mirrors were broken and there was graffiti everywhere. We were fairly sure there were people hiding in there while we were inside, even if we never saw anyone the first two times that we went. There were a couple of shopping carts from a nearby Fred Meyer inside, with cans and bottles inside them and a few dirty blankets scattered around in different rooms. It looked lived in. After getting to know the layout of the place the first couple of trips, we made a game of it for the third and final visit. This time, the six of us that went split into three groups of two, and with our partner, the two of us would enter the front together and spend a full five minutes inside while the others waited outside at our chosen exit in the back of the building. The first two, Beck and Doug, both went in while we waited outside. About seven minutes went by, and just as we were starting to worry that we should go in after them, they made it out to the other side, through the fire exit. Doug told us that they went upstairs into the office, and there was a sleeping bag they hadn't been there on the last visit, and as soon as they went up and saw it, they tried to leave immediately, but they got turned around and tried to leave through the wrong exit, which was sealed shut. They were paranoid that they were being followed out, so they just stood there watching the way they entered the theater room for about a minute, making sure that they didn't hear any noises, before they finally worked up the nerve to run out the correct exit in the room across the hallway. Doug and Beck both wanted us all to leave, but Jack and I weren't having any of that and insisted on going in. Brad and Drew, the other group of two that was going to go in last, wanted to come with us, so the four of us went inside while Beck and Doug both waited by the exit. The first thing we all wanted to do when we got inside was go and check out the upstairs office. Just as we started to make our way up the stairs, we all heard a loud banging sound. It was coming from the back of the theater. We all agreed it had to have been Beck and Doug trying to scare us so that we would come out and we could leave. We got upstairs and the pounding stopped. Doug was right. There was a sleeping bag rolled on the ground with a few paper bags set up around it. Brad flashed a light into one of them and saw a syringe and something that looked like a vibrator. We were all pretty grossed out and we had a little laugh about it. We looked around up there and didn't really notice anything else interesting and we were starting back down the stairs when the pounding started again. We decided we should probably make our way to the exit. I hoped we hadn't been caught trespassing by the police. We came out through the exit and immediately both Doug and Beck were talking over themselves to tell us about a minute after we entered the theater, a really tall creepy homeless looking man with greasy hair walked right past them, heading for the entrance. 
Beck said hello as he passed, and the guy stopped. He then turned and kind of lunged a few inches toward him before stopping. One side of his face was really wrinkly. Beck thinks maybe he was a burn victim or something. The guy stared him down for a second, and then, without saying anything, turned and walked around the corner where he had gone inside. They started pounding on the door right after he was out of sight. They were trying to warn us that there was some scary dude in there with us. We were in there for about five minutes with him, and we never saw him. He had to have heard us though, and hid somewhere. We started to walk back to our car in the Fred Meyer parking lot, about a hundred yards away from the theater. That's when a car pulled into the parking lot and shined its headlights on us, before then flashing its red and blues. The police officer had us all sit down in front of the spotlight in front of his vehicle and asked us what we were doing. We told him we were going to head inside the movie theater, but a really scary tall guy walked in and we chickened out. He told us that it was really dangerous of a place to go into as there had been violence in that building before and it'd be a shame if we got hurt doing something stupid. He let us go and as we drove off, we saw him shining a light inside the front entrance. We took the nice police officer's advice, and we never went into places like this again. Now, I never did find out what violence he was talking about. Maybe it was just a scare tactic, so we wouldn't come back. We stuck to graveyards and cemeteries after this. So creepy dude that lives in condemned buildings, I'm glad I never actually met you but thank you for getting me out of a ticket for trespassing. And thank you to everyone else hiding in the building for not assaulting myself or my friends. This happened nearly five years ago now, but unfortunately, the memory remains very ingrained in my mind. Here's a bit of context to get started. I live in a medium-sized city that in 2011 was badly affected by a strong earthquake. Around 200 people were killed, and a large portion of the city's older buildings were either outright destroyed or they were deemed uninhabitable. One such building was the affectionately coined mental rehabilitation center, Sunnyside. Naturally, having a significant number of mentally ill patients without a roof over their head only exacerbated the city's problems at this stage, and short-term solutions were desperately in need. From my understanding, hospitals with the necessary facilities took the bulk of the load, while other temporary hospice and homestays were forced to become somewhat more of a permanent fixture, even if they lacked the security that previously would have been a necessity to house these patients. I would later come to learn that one of those temporary hospitals was less than a block from my house. My house, along with the majority of the houses on my street, back onto a small creek which runs through our suburb. It is relatively common for neighbors to go down the creek so they could visit those who live a few houses along or on the other embankment and virtually none of the properties have a back fence which prevents access. So it's about four weeks after the initial quake and things are beginning to return to some sense of normality. We're still being forced to use a communal porta potty out on the road, but in general, we're on the mend. It was a Sunday night and I'd gone to bed early because tomorrow was going to be my first day back at work in almost a month. At some point in the night, I later found out it was around 1.30 a.m. I began to stir as I realized the soft laughter I was hearing in my dreams was actually a physical, real-life laugh. It was very faint, childlike almost, a giggle. Anyway, sitting up from my dreary state, I assumed my brother had left the television on in the lounge, so dragging myself out of bed. I staggered down the hallway to switch it off. However, as I approached the living room, 
I soon realized that the laughter isn't increasing in volume, and upon reaching the room, I confirm that indeed, there is no TV or radio producing any sound. Suddenly, feeling a bit foolish, I make my way back towards my room, where I hear no further giggling. Passing it off as my sleep-deprived brain playing tricks on me, I get back into bed and I soon fall asleep. An hour later, I was again stirred awake, this time by the soft plucking of my steel string guitar, which I keep in my office at the other end of the hall. No discernible melody, just random touches. Feeling very frustrated at this point for being woken up twice in one night, I immediately fling myself out of bed, determined to find the source of these irritating noises. Now, before I even make it two steps toward the door, the noise comes to an abrupt halt, and I realize that it too was coming from my room. More perplexed than angry at this point, I whirl around to see what could possibly be producing this noise, and all at once, I feel like the wind had been knocked out of me. Sitting in the corner of my room, cross-legged on a puddle of wet carpet, is a large, shaggy man, wearing sewed clothes and holding my guitar. A million simultaneous thoughts go through my mind at that instant. The obvious, what the hell, who the hell, and how the hell were very prevalent, but also a more bizarre thought process was like, God, it annoys me when people touch my guitar without asking. All logical thoughts seemed to come to a complete standstill at that point, and, for whatever reason, some deep-seated social cue came roaring to life, and my mouth sputtered out the words, Would, would you like a cup of tea? Because, you know, obviously the first thing you do when someone comes to your house is offer them a cup of tea, right? The man seems pleased with this interaction. He perks up and nods brightly. Finally, the rational part of my brain awakens from its coma, and I turn and sprint from the room, slamming it shut behind me. I scream for my brother to call the police, while holding onto the door handle with all my might, dreading the desperate struggle that was sure to ensue. There's a man in my room, he comes running, and once seeing the look of terror on my face, does not waste time in making the phone call. While listening to him give the operator our address, and pleading with them to hurry, I hear a soft knock-knock on the other side of the door. No sugar, please. The word bamboozled comes to mind when I think about this moment. I fully expected to reach down, pinch my arm, and awaken from the most vivid dream of my life. The police arrived not long after. There were many patrols to deter looters, and my brother led them to me and the end of the hall, my knuckles turning white on the doorknob. After mentally bracing myself, I let go of the handle and leapt backwards, letting the policemen do their thing. They rushed into the room, tasers drawn shouting at this home invader to show himself. Their aggression was short-lived, however, and I was still close enough to see why. The man was simply sitting on the edge of my bed now, amusing himself by playing with one of my figurines. I think the officers were also taken aback by this, as they halted for a second before continuing a touch more gingerly. To cut a rather long-winded story short, and to confirm what you most likely have probably deduced, Yes, this man was a mental patient who had slipped out of his temporary hospice and gone along the river looking for houses to explore. Muddy footprints on my neighbor's decks confirmed that he had originally tried to enter their homes. I was simply the one foolish enough to leave his unlocked. The police took him away, and they later gave me a follow-up call to say that he had been put in a much more secure location but that I should still be a lot more vigilant when it comes to securing my house. In hindsight, I believe this man was totally harmless. Ill, yes, obviously, but not malicious. I mean, there was ample opportunity when he could have harmed me, had this actually been his intent, but he did not do so. He 
simply took my unlocked door as an invitation to come in. I did not press charges, as I did not want to damage a life of an already damaged person. The incident, however, left me pretty shaken up, excuse the earthquake pun, for quite some time, and I struggle falling asleep sometimes. But for the most part, I have moved on. There is one thing that I have not been able to let go of, however. I believe this one detail has left a permanent scar on my psyche. As the police were leading the man from my house, he uttered a short giggle, the same one I heard when I was awoken originally. The man couldn't find me under his bed. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce, and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood. That's a 10-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley Hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value has skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside of our house. Although my mom was especially protective all of our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rod and Robbie gas station on the other end of the block so we could grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop and my sister would grab a Three Musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 years old at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us, and nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple of dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. Now, I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of doom when I'd pass it. I was almost positive that somebody was living inside of it, because at times, I'd hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in that same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door. I'd always keep an eye on it, for the fear that one day it'd swing open just as I came to pass by it. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing tape to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was to be intended. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident, I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby, and unfortunately, we had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and we could continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long, and while mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school 
where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing I stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be like a tiny, malformed face. My stomach now turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and I can say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside of a large mass, perfect circles like those made by circular ring rulers. Its face was contorted as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I'd never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body, and my chest hurt with fear, but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops, and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mother. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings toward the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the floor, I thought about it every time we drove by. And about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several dollars and permission to walk down to the Rotten Robbie and grab ourselves respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver, and I was terrified she'd make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright, sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it was going to go away. We walked past the camper, and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it as half as much a thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on the edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened, and I became aware of everything around me, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound, like a heavy backpack of some sort, and, nervously, I half turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkept beard and was wearing many layers of ragged clothing, stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arc of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seemingly genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction like a zombie with a direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we'd spent living there, and I realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us, I choked out my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, she told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part 
is that he started running before we even had a chance to do so. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting in our direction before she got to three, but his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you'd imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast we didn't even have the breath to scream and peering back behind me about 10 seconds later, I saw him running in our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house, and without looking behind us, we yanked open the stubborn old door before then slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep in the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the light of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what had just happened, like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about. I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity, and that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years ago if she remembered this incident. I'm 25, and she's 28 now, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. But I don't know. I'd like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they're rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and the gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around in the area. I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. I'm not proud of how I handled this and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around you. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way I can't forget. So possibly deranged camper guy by the gas station, whatever your intent was, let's not meet. First, a little bit of background context. This began when I was 19 years old and continued for several years after that. I'm male, which I suppose does matter to the story. When I was in high school and my first year of college, I worked at a local grocery store part-time. I did everything, bagging groceries, stocking shelves, cashiering, working at the service desk, etc. Toward the end of my time there, I was doing more of the stuff in front of the store, mainly at the service desk, since I'd been there forever, or even cashiering. Anyway, it was just a small little grocery store, so we'd have regulars, 
Many of the same customers would come in a lot, and we talk with them and get to know them. I was also very young and naive at the time, and thus overly trusting. That would prove to be my deterrent. There was this one guy who would come in about once a week, sometimes twice a week, and I'd been his cashier a few times. Eventually, he started standing in my line, even if other lines were shorter, which wasn't so unusual. I hated working in retail, but I was damn good with the customers, and I was even well liked. The only odd thing was that generally the people who would do this were a lot older, 60s or 70s at least, and were usually ladies, whereas this was a guy who had to have been, at most, in his mid-40s. But whatever, I didn't think much of it. His name was Jeff. I didn't know his name for a long time because he always paid with cash. But when I finally learned what it was, it was in one of the worst ways you can think of. We'll go to that. At first though, Jeff seemed harmless. He would chat me up, and if I didn't have a line, we'd sometimes talk a bit. He seemed interested in me and my life, but again, this wasn't so unusual, apart from his age mostly, but I just went with it. Jeff would ask me things about myself like innocent questions, or so I thought. He'd ask me what college I went to, and I told him because I had no reason not to. At one point, he brought up cars, and he asked which one was mine. The parking lot was clearly visible through the large windows at the front of the store, and I stupidly pointed up at my car, and I said, It's that one. We lived in a small area, and a lot of times by talking with customers, we'd realize we lived near each other, or something like that. So I didn't think much of it when he asked me where I lived. I told him the name of the town, which was adjacent to the city the store was in. And then when he asked where in that town I lived, I told him my street, and then described my house like a total idiot. I like to think I'm a smart guy in most situations, but that was not the case in this one. I didn't realize it at the time, but Jeff was systematically gathering information about me, but by the time I realized what was happening, it was already too late. I had told him everything short of giving him my cell phone number or actual address. One day, I was working in the service desk when Jeff came in and he wanted me to ring his groceries up. However, I was busy selling lottery or a money order to a customer or something, and I can't remember, so I told him that I couldn't. He got this look on his face, like he didn't like the fact that I had told him no, but it was just for a second, and then he was smiling again. I didn't really talk to him much, because, you know, I was with a customer. And Jeff just stood there staring at me. I didn't really notice at first, because whatever machine I was using, a lottery or money order, again, I can't remember. It was giving me hell. Eventually, the customer was like, that guy keeps staring at you. And that's when I looked over at him. He wasn't smiling, but looked kind of angry instead. But the moment that I looked at him, the smile was back on his face. Then Jeff said something about me wearing a skirt. Now, this wasn't the kind of humor he had exhibited before, and it was totally out of nowhere, so it gave me pause. I just kind of looked back at him as he went on about how I look in a skirt or dress, just staring at him with a total what-the-hell expression on my face, and the more he talked about it, the more unnerved I became. Another co-worker, Miranda, was in the service center with me, and she and the customer as well as another nearby cashier were all giving him what I presume were the same identical what the hell is happening expressions. He wasn't stopping however, so I realized I had to say something to just make him stop, and I couldn't even pretend to be humored by it when I told him. I don't know what you're talking about, 
You'll never see me in anything but this uniform. My tone was serious, and he knew that I wasn't amused. The smile was gone, and I saw something on his face that I had never seen before. It was anger. Yeah, but it was also humiliation, and he did not like it one bit. He glared at me with a look that I felt in my bones, that rushed through me like a cold chill. My breath caught in my throat as we just stared at each other. I don't even know how to explain it, other than to say that this was the most menacing way that anyone has ever looked at me. With that look, he was saying, You're going to be sorry. I'm sure of it. Maybe I wasn't at the time, but in hindsight, without another word, he turned and walked away. After that, whenever Jeff would come into the store, he never stood in my line, which was fine with me. However, he would always loudly talk about me from other registers and then glare over at me. He would badmouth me, but not in such an overt way where we could really do much about it. Sometimes he wouldn't even refer to me by name, but we all knew he was talking about me. Sometimes at night, I would be the only cashier at the front as we approached closing time. Another would be in the office counting the drawers for the day, while the manager and the other workers were usually in the back or throughout the store stocking shelves or even cleaning. In the evenings when I was more or less alone, I would notice this same car pull into the parking lot, but the driver never came in. The main defining feature of this vehicle was the fact that one of the headlights was burnt out. Because of the previously mentioned large windows, anyone in the parking lot could look into the store right at me. It took me longer than I'm proud of to realize what exactly was happening here, and the only way I realized who was in the car was actually by chance. My car was in the shop, so my mom picked me up after work when I was done, and as I was waiting for her to get there, outside in front of the building, I was able to see into the car away from the bright lights of the store. Sure enough, it was Jeff. My shock was obviously warranted, and that was when I truly realized that something was very, very not right about all of this at all. I actually backed away in fear and kept imagining what I would do if he got out of the car. The door inside had locked behind me, and while there were people in the store still, they weren't in front. But luckily, that was when my mom got there. I didn't tell her because my story would only worry her. Everyone at the store knew about Jeff before long, and it got so bad that when he would come inside, everyone would instantly tell me to go into the back, and they would page me overhead when he left. Everyone, even managers. We all knew, and we were all creeped out. A lot of times he would come in, and when he didn't see me, he would immediately leave again, or so I was told. I remember once we didn't notice him walking in, and by the time we realized, he was almost to the doors. Another cashier, Laura, saw him and looked scared. Now, Laura wasn't easily rattled, but this guy had us all on the edge, mostly because they were afraid of his weird fascination with me. She urged me frantically to hurry and get in the back. I hadn't noticed him just yet and was confused, and I started to ask her why, but before I could finish, she said, Just go. I clearly remember this moment, these few seconds between the time she said that and the time I saw him walking through the door where I realized what was happening. Jeff saw me before I rushed into the back and I was so unnerved that I locked the back door of the loading dock, worried he was going to come back there and look for me. When he was gone, Laura called me back up and she just couldn't even say anything. She told me that he gave her a furious look and then stormed out to the store, and I remember being worried he would retaliate against her, but luckily, he never did. That's when things got worse. I began seeing Jeff around town, like when I would go to the movies, 
to various stores, gas stations, the mall, even the bank once. Just a couple of these times might be a coincidence, but this was happening a lot. Plus, it was Jeff, so I knew it was much more than that. But the thing is, I had no proof that he was stalking me at this point, and still, I didn't tell my parents. At the time while I was in college, I lived at home and commuted to school, and I would often be there until after dark. By this point, it was winter, and it got dark early. There were times when I would pull out of the school parking lot, and very shortly after that, I'd see a car behind me with just one headlight. Once or twice, again, could be a weird coincidence, but this was happening probably once a week. I still didn't tell my parents, even though I was pretty sure it was him. Then, one night, when I was walking out of school into the naturally dark and deserted parking lot, I saw a car parked in an empty part of it with the lights off. I didn't think anything of it until the lights came on and there was only one headlight. I knew that it was him and I sprinted to my car, threw my stuff into it and got the hell out of there. After that, I started walking out with either security guards or friends when I could and a couple of times I thought I saw his car but he never put his lights on unless I was alone. He would never approach me or drive toward me during those times. It was like he was taunting me. It was like he just wanted me to know that he was there, that he knew how to find me. This continued even after I quit working at the store. I became a tutor at a school instead, but his stalking, because that's what it was. I knew that for sure now. It didn't cease. Once I was at a friend's house after dark, and then I drove home, but I was almost there when I realized I'd forgotten something. Instead of pulling around in the driveway, I was going to just loop around the street because it was easier, so I drove past my house. This particular night, I was home alone. Both my siblings lived elsewhere, and my parents were out, so the house was dark. There shouldn't have been anyone in the driveway because I'd just spoken to my parents, and they were nowhere near home. But when I drove by, I saw the dark shape of a car and tail lights. Sometimes people turned around in our driveway because it was big, so I thought maybe that's what it was, or maybe someone had car trouble. But then the car pulled out of the driveway after me, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and I saw it. The car only had one headlight. This dude was at my house, and he had been waiting for me to get there. He followed me for a while, and I couldn't go home, and I also didn't want to lead him to know any of my friends. So I drove back to the store I used to work at, rushed inside, and looked out the windows to see if he followed me. Miranda was working that night and asked me what was going on, and I couldn't even speak. All I could do was look at her, and she knew. Her eyes got wide, and she couldn't speak either. After that, Jeff began following me more. He'd be at my school more often, and it was like he knew my schedule. He knew where I'd be, and when I'd be there. I saw him so often, and I'd shudder thinking about the times that I didn't see him, but I knew he had to be there somewhere, and it wasn't just my schedule he learned. He knew my parents too, to an extent, at least when I would be home alone. A few times I'd hear a car pull into the driveway at night, and I knew it was him even before I looked, but he never got out of his car, that I could see at least, and he would only stay for 10 minutes or so. Mainly, this would be on Wednesday or Sunday nights when my parents would be at church, and I began avoiding the house at these times, either staying at school to study, or hanging out with friends, or going to the movies or something. At the time, I would occasionally babysit for someone at my parents' church, but during this time, 
I eventually stopped doing that, afraid that he would follow me there as well. I decided I need to look into this guy. Now, at the time, I didn't even know this guy's name, but something told me to look at the sex offenders database. So one day while at my friend Jill's house, I did just that. We looked at various pictures of nearby sex offenders and discovered the shocking amount of them in the vicinity and eventually one of the small thumbnail pictures caught my eye. It was hard to tell if it was him so I clicked on it to bring up a larger picture and more information about him. Jill's internet was crap so the page loaded slowly. His name came up first. It was Jeff. Jill and I waited for the picture to load and as it slowly came into view, I literally stopped breathing for a second because it was him. That's how I learned his name and that's how I learned that the man who was stalking me was a sexual predator. I didn't know what to do with this information. Thus far, he hadn't done anything illegal per se, but I knew I needed to tell my parents. So I told them everything, and they were shocked, to say the least. They had no idea. Jeff was good at hiding his activities, which makes me think he wasn't just not very stealthy with me, that I didn't catch him so often, because he sucked at being subtle. No, Jeff wanted me to know that I was being watched, that I was the object of his obsession. So I told them everything. My dad was angry, like I swear if he knew where Jeff was, he would have gone to threaten him to leave me alone or something. My mom was just scared, like really scared. She even cried a little bit as well. We briefly discussed calling the police, but again, Jeff hadn't actually broken the law, other than maybe trespassing on our property, but I couldn't prove it was him. All we could do was be vigilant. I thought I would feel better when they knew, but I felt worse. However, they needed to know. Everyone in my life needed to know. So they did. We started taking precautions. By this point, I was in my 20s, but I felt like a child. I didn't have a curfew per se, but my parents were hesitant to leave me alone even during the daytime. My dad is normally not easily rattled, which is why it was so unnerving to see him so shaken up by this. We started keeping the cats inside, and when the dogs were out, we wouldn't let them out of our sight. More than a few times, I remember sitting out on the back steps after letting them out to keep an eye on them and just feeling like I was being watched. By this point, I never felt comfortable, never felt safe. So it might have just been paranoia, but I don't know. My mom also got me pepper spray, and I would carry it with me at all times when I was out to the house, and at night, I would take a knife to bed. Jeff didn't stop. I remember one time I was at a friend's apartment, and while she was in the bathroom, her front door started rattling, like someone was trying to open it. Luckily, it was locked, and before she even got out of the bathroom, it had stopped. I didn't tell her at first, because she wouldn't be spending the night there, so she wouldn't be alone. After that, I stopped going to my friend's house. I stopped going anywhere if I could help it, especially alone. This went on for years. I was out of college, and it was still happening. For at least five years this went on. When I moved into my first place on my own, I was scared, but I had been seeing him less and less, and I didn't want to live with my parents forever. Things went fine mostly, and there would be weeks and then months in between Jeff sightings. Then one day I saw him at the store, and I left right away, not wanting him to see me. I didn't think he did and made a few more stops before heading home, and that's when I realized I shouldn't let myself get complacent about this situation. I always, always made sure my doors and windows were locked when I wasn't home, 
and even when I was sometimes, especially at night, or if I just had a bad feeling, I'd be doing this since even before the Jeff situation began. So that was how I knew there was no way that I left my front door not only unlocked, but slightly open. This wasn't right, and I should have called the police, but I was feeling brazen. I think I was so tired of feeling like I wasn't in control that I was trying to take the situation back into my own hands. So I readied my pepper spray, and I headed inside, and then I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife, and I went around my place and checked every closet, checked under every bed, checked everywhere someone could be hiding, but nobody was there. That was a truly terrifying experience. I kept expecting him to pop out of some hiding place or something, but he didn't. Jeff wasn't there. I still couldn't sleep there that night though, and I didn't want anyone to know, so I got to hotel room that night. For a long time, I never told anyone about this incident because this was a clear line that Jeff had crossed. I have no proof that it was him, but I know it was him. I never called the police though, because nothing was missing, and there were no signs that anyone had broken in at all. But I know he had been there. I felt him. It scares me to wonder what would have happened if I had been home alone when he got there. Now, unless you've been through something like this, you can't know what it's like to go through this sort of experience, how it wrecks havoc on your psyche, how it shatters your trust and your sense of safety. These are things you don't really notice until they're ripped away from you. There's this feeling of security that I've lost, and I don't think I'll ever get it back. It's been years since I've seen or heard from Jeff, though I still live in the area. I have no idea if he's still watching me or not. Most of the time, I think he's moved on or has been jailed on something, but every once in a while, I'll be in a parking lot or home alone, and I just get that feeling, the one I've come to associate with him. Maybe it's just the paranoia, a gift that Jeff gave me the day he talked about me wearing a dress. I hope that's all of it, but sometimes I wonder. It's just a part of my life now. I don't talk about it much, but everyone in my life knows about it. It's like the elephant in the room. I've changed a lot since then. I've gotten anxiety issues, and I'm extremely private. I'm not sure it's all because of this, but at least it is a factor. I'm still cautious. I still don't like to go out alone after dark. I still lock my doors and windows, whether or not it's nighttime, whether or not I'm home alone. I lock the bathroom door every time I shower. I check the locks at least three times before going to sleep. I still feel nervous if anything seems out of place at my apartment, or if I can't find something that should be in a particular place, but isn't. I still carry pepper spray with me, even during the daytime, and I still take a knife with me to bed. I've had a lot of stalkers in my life, more than I would honestly like to admit. They are all creepy, but for some reason, the guy I'm going to talk about in here was the most creepy, but yet the least harmful of them all. The name will be changed, as I suspect he uses Reddit. Anyway, we met in college through friends in common. We had similar interests, similar humor. We had been to the same events in the city, and he had actually known me way before when I did cosplaying. So we started talking and hanging out a lot. I, for some reason, never felt comfortable hanging out with him alone, so I always had a friend with me and refused to see him outside of the university campus for some reason I still can't explain. He always seemed bothered by it, but never really said it out loud. Around a month after meeting him, I was, well, horny, feeling lonely, and hadn't been to any social gatherings recently, nor had any flirting or someone to flirt with. I accidentally mentioned this to Kevin, the guy, when chatting one day, and he suggested he felt the same and that we should take care of that together. He isn't a bad looking guy, 
and seemed pretty kind by the way he spoke and offered it to me. So I said, okay, I'll go to your house after class and let's see if we have some sort of chemistry. Kevin was a medicine student. I'm an art student. Our faculties are separated by literally kilometers. He had never been in my hallway before or my faculty for all of that matter. I never been in his either. We and our friends always met in the middle of both. However, that day, as I was going out the door, he was there waving at me. I asked how the hell did he know where I was, and when my class ended, he didn't answer that. He just smiled like a kid who just surprised his mother with breakfast or something. So off we went to his house, which was conveniently close to college, around a 10 minute walk. I started to invent excuses because I was feeling uncomfortable, like having to go buy bread or checking an art store or doing this and that. He basically accompanied me to everything I came up with. Eventually, I ran out of things to say and finally ended up at his place. I still remember him breathing hard while we were both in the elevator. Fast forward, maybe an hour of us awkwardly talking in the living room trying to start the deed, but failing. I faked a stomach sickness. I said that I needed some homemade medicine common in my country, and he magically had all of the ingredients. He tried to rub my stomach, and I kind of freaked out and told him, leave the touching for later when I feel better. Fast forward half an hour later, he went into his bedroom and then came out in his underwear, socks, and a Burger King crown on his head. He now asked if we were going to get down to it or not. Now, I'm normally a no-filter person, but his behavior kept putting me off, and I'd figured by now that I had been uncomfortable since the very beginning, but that it was probably the best idea to act as dumb as I could. So I convinced him that today wasn't the best day to do that, and we left. He insisted to escort me back to my college, just in case, and I refused. But he still followed me in silence, walking around five meters behind me. I then saw him with a corner of my eye, and I decided not to confront it. I gradually started ghosting him, stopped replying to his message, gave him vague answers, stopped sharing my information, answering just, okay, wow, haha, lol, yeah, I know, right? Oh, okay. This went on for another two to three weeks. I barely gave him any information of my whereabouts earlier, so I thought he was going to leave me alone. He still showed up in my hall and my facility from time to time, but I made sure to avoid him as much as I could, and I also started hanging more with some other friends that didn't know him. You see, this is where it gets creepy. Before I knew him, I joined the football team of my school, career, major, so most of the afternoons, I was always at the same court where we trained and stuff. I stayed there for around 4 hours almost every day of the week. I had been going there with my new group of friends for 6 months to train. Then Kevin came into my life for 2 more months. In this 2 months, I never told them where I trained. I did tell them I played football but never that I played inside the college campus. One night, he messaged me as usual. I was still in the process of gradually ghosting, so I chatted for a bit, with long time intervals in between messages, and casually mentioned that no, I couldn't meet up with him the next day because I had class and then training. He asked when I was getting off practice, and I said, I don't know, probably late. Then... I completely stopped answering. Next day afternoon, I trained with my dudes as usual. I still am the only girl on the team by the way. It attracts creepers but I learned to ignore them and they usually all chill in a tree that's behind the fence where I normally stand. I play as the goalie so I normally don't look back or to other places that isn't the game in front of me. We play for around 4 to 5 hours, then we chill a little bit in the court benches, then head to the law faculty. 
which is the closest place where we can all refill our water. This has been our routine for an entire eight months. The law faculty is still pretty far away from the court, but we like it there. While my friends are refilling their coolers, I check my phone. It starts buzzing, and I see as the unread messages pop-ups increase from 9 to 17 in seconds. Where are you? I don't see you. Please tell me where you are. I'm looking for you. Shit, I go to the bathroom one minute. One minute, and that's the minute you decide to disappear. How do you do this? I've been watching you all afternoon, and you didn't move for four hours. Where are you? Shit, I can't find you. You look nice playing though. Very nice. Probably those dudes all flirt with you. Keep training to get that body looking even more good. I still can't find you. Are you going to tell me where you are or not? Can we hang out later? I miss talking to you. God dang it, I swear, if I don't see you right now, I'm leaving. Where are you? I nervously looked around, closed the chat, and then locked my phone. We were on the second floor of the faculty. My dudes didn't notice I was nervous, but I usually grab the arm of the biggest one of them, and my best friend too, and hanged onto him, whining about being tired as an excuse. Once we finished going down the stairs, Kevin walked right in front of us. He went towards us and casually kept walking to go upstairs. We locked eyes for a second. I smiled at a joke and grabbed my friend's arm even tighter, but inside I was freaked out. The dudes of course didn't notice. There were five of them and all of them are buff. To this very day, I still think he didn't do anything because I was surrounded by guys who could clearly beat his skinny ass. Whatever that anything was, I planned on staying after practice that day so I could chill and maybe have a beer or two with whatever friend I could find. But I ended up leaving as fast as I could once all of my friends denied wanting to stay nor refused to accompany me to the other exit of my university. We all had to take different exits that were closer to our houses or the route we took to get home, so I ended up faking I had to go to the other direction, which has conveniently the exit Kevin took to go to his home, just so I didn't have to walk alone. I didn't see Kevin again after this, and I completely ghosted him that night. I still have him added on Facebook, so I'm able to check his whereabouts and avoid him the best I can. Anyway, thanks for leaving the country, Kevin.